This afternoon we'll find our text from God's Word as we confess it, and as it's been summarized in the Oliver Catechism with regard to the Lord's Supper and what the Lord's Supper also teaches us. We'll read together Lord's Days 28, 29, and question and answer 80 of Lord's Day uh, 30. Remember that in the time of the Reformation, of course, one of the, the big issues uh, between the, the men of the Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church was the issue of the Lord's Supper, which is why then also a lot of time is spent in the Catechism uh, dealing with uh, the Lord's uh, Supper, uh, some three uh, Lord's Days. We will uh, combine the, the three Lord's Days, the parts that deal with the understanding about the meaning of the Lord's Supper itself uh, this afternoon. So let's turn then to Lord's Day 28. Uh, question and answer is 75. And there we confess, uh, how does the Lord's Supper signify and seal to you that you share in Christ one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts? In this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat of this broken bread and drink of this cup in remembrance of him. With this command, he gave these promises. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely was his body offered for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. And second, as surely as I receive from the hand of the minister and taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely does he himself nourish and refresh my soul to eternal life with his crucified body and his shed blood. What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his shed blood? And first, and to accept with a believing heart all the suffering and the death of Christ, and so receive forgiveness of sins and life eternal. And second, to be united more and more to his sacred body uh, through the Holy Spirit, who lives both in Christ and in us. And therefore, although Christ is in heaven and we are on earth, yet we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, and we forever live and are governed by one spirit, as the members of our body are by one soul. Where is Christ's promise that he will nourish and refresh believers uh, with his body and blood as surely as they eat of this broken bread and drink of this cup in the institution of the Lord's Supper? The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's from 1 Corinthians 11. This promise is repeated by Paul where he says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. That's from 1 Corinthians 10. Are then the bread and wine changed into the real body and the blood of Christ? No. Just as the water of baptism is not changed into the blood of Christ and is not the washing away of sins itself, but is simply God's sign and pledge, and so also the bread in the Lord's Supper does not become the body of Christ itself, although it is called Christ's body, in keeping with the nature and usage of sacraments. Why then does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood? And why does Paul speak of our participation in the body and blood of Christ? Christ speaks in this way for a good reason. He wants to teach us by his supper that his bread and wine sustain us in this eternal life, and so his crucified body and shed blood are true food and drink for our souls to eternal life. But even more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge first that through the working of the Holy Spirit, we share in his true body and blood, as surely as we receive with our mouth these holy signs in remembrance of him. And second, that all his suffering and obedience are as certainly ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our uh, sins. And then question and answer 80 in Lord's Day 30 deals here with the comparison between the Lord's Supper and what the Roman Catholic uh, Church t uh, practices as the Papal Mass. What's the difference? What difference is there between the Lord's Supper and the Papal Mass? The Lord's Supper testifies to us first that we have complete forgiveness of all our sins through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself accomplished on the cross once for all. And second, that through the Holy Spirit we are grafted into Christ, who with his true body 
is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and this is where he wants to be worshipped. But the Mass teaches, first, that the living and the dead do not have forgiveness of sins through the suffering of Christ, unless he is still offered for them daily by the priests. And second, that Christ is daily present in the form of bread and wine, and there is to be worshipped. And therefore, the Mass is basically nothing but a denial of the one sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ and an accursed idolatry. And so far, our reading of the Heidelberg Catechism and our confession concerning the Lord's Supper. <coughs> Congregation of our Lord in Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus first celebrated the Lord's Supper together with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed, betrayed by his disciple Judas Iscariot. On that night, we read in the Gospels that he celebrated the Passover meal for the last time uh, together with his disciples. And we know that the Passover uh, was the sign and seal of God's covenant that God had made with his people there in the Old Testament in which God constantly reminded his people Israel how he had come and delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. During this Passover meal, the Lord Jesus was having with his disciples on that last night, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. When at a certain point during the meal, he took the bread and he also took the wine and he gave it to them. And he said to them, as he gave the bread, he said, this is my body. And he gave them the, the wine. He said, this is my blood that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so as, as God long ago had commanded the people of Israel that they should celebrate the Passover from generation to generation so, they, that, so that they would never forget how the Lord had delivered them out of Egypt, so the Lord now commands his disciples that they are to celebrate this supper in the future in remembrance of him so that they would never forget what he had done for them. And so the supper, it is to serve as a constant reminder of the saving work of our Lord Jesus, and that was to be, to be remembered from generation to generation to generation. Now the supper itself does not only serve as a memorial in which we, in which we remember something that happened long ago in the past, but it is also a constant reminder for us today how that work of the Lord Jesus on the cross in the past now daily impacts my life of faith with my Lord. The Lord's Supper teaches us that there is indeed a very present reality about Christ's work. Christ is also working today in my life. For the Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord, and he is now also my Savior today. And therefore, the Lord's Supper focuses our hearts and it focuses our minds today on the Lord Jesus there in heaven as my Lord and as my Savior. And that, beloved, doesn't only have implications for our life today, in which we now look up to the Lord Jesus as our Savior, but also has implications for my life going forward into the future. For it is through this supper that the Lord is constantly reminding us that there's a glorious future ahead, a glorious future that awaits all the people of God. And so this afternoon, we will confess God's word under this theme. The bread and wine are signs and seals of the new covenant with Christ. So the bread and wine are signs and seals of the new covenant with Christ. And we'll look at the significance of this supper. First of all, in the past, in the present, and for the future. So we look at the, at the significance of the supper as we look at it from the perspective of what happened in the past, and the pre what's happening in the present, and what will happen in, in the future. When the Lord Jesus celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples uh, there just before he was betrayed, uh, Luke in chapter 22, verse 19, says that he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he also took the wine as a sign of his blood. And so when we now celebrate the Lord's Supper, then 
there is always bread and there's always wine on the table because those are the two signs that the Lord Jesus has given to us. He says, the bread, it is a sign of my body, and the wine, Jesus says, is a sign of my blood that was given for you on the cross. And so that bread and that wine that, that we see at the Lord's Supper is a constant reminder of what the Lord Jesus has done for us long ago when he gave his life on the cross as a sacrifice for our salvation. And so you see what the purpose is to the Lord's Supper. Christ gave his Lord's Supper so that our attention is always being directed back again to the Lord Jesus. We're constantly being reminded about the great sacrifice uh, that he gave for us on the cross for our sins. And so you can say, in, in, in the same way, the Passover in Israel was a constant reminder to the people of Israel how the Lord God had come and delivered them out of Egypt when they were in slavery in Egypt. And as Israel was told, you are never to forget about the Lord your God and what he did for you when you were in Egypt. So today, in the Lord's Supper, we are taught by the Lord that we are never to forget about what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross. Every time we have celebration of the Lord's Supper, where is our attention being focused? Our attention is focused again on the Lord Jesus and on what he has done for us. And then, of course, the supper also reminds us, what does it really mean that the Lord Jesus died uh, on the cross? Why did he have to die? Remember when the Lord Jesus gave his disciples the cup uh, with the wine, he said this. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So you see, the Lord Jesus says, this is a sign of the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. And so Jesus is talking here about a covenant bond that he has with his people. One of the things that we find throughout Scripture is that the Lord God, when he enters into a relationship with his people, he always enters into a, a covenant with them. It's like, like marriage. Uh, it's not like two people just love each other and, and, and get to know each other, but when you get to know each other, you also enter into a, a marriage covenant, into a covenant relationship. And so God, too, uh, when, he gets, when he enters into a, a relationship with his people, he enters into a covenant bond with them. And in that covenant, he gives us a sign. And he says, this is my sign uh, that I have entered into this relationship with you. And so in the Old Testament, the, the sign that God gave to Israel was the Passover meal. God says to his people, he says, this is my sign to you uh, that I am the Lord your God. Remember, I'm the God who delivered you out of Egypt. I took you out of Egypt. I brought you si to Sinai. There I made a covenant with you. There I said I would be the Lord your God and that you would be my people. And so in that covenant, God makes Israel his own people. First of all, he does that by delivering them out of slavery so that they would have freedom. And that means that the people of Israel can always look back to the Lord God and say, yes, he is my Lord. And I know that he will indeed care for me because he has delivered me from slavery. I know that he is the God who will also protect me. He is the God who will give to me everlasting life. Well, that was in the Old Testament. And then the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, and he says to us, beloved, that through my saving work, through my broken body, through my shed blood on the cross, what I've done for you is I have delivered you from your sin, and I have brought you now into a living relationship with the Lord your God. And so in this covenant that the Lord Jesus makes with us, the Lord Jesus doesn't just give a promise. He also gives us signs and he also gives us uh, seals. And so in the Lord's Supper, the Lord comes and he gives us bread and he gives us wine. And as he gives us the bread and as he gives us the wine, he says, I am the Lord your God who has bought you with my body and I bought you with my blood. And therefore, you can always trust me uh, that I will always save you and I will deliver you. And so it is that through that bread and through that wine that the Lord constantly reminds us about his great love, a love that is so great that he says, I was willing to offer my life for you on the cross so that I might pay for all of your sins and that I might give to you the glorious hope of the life everlasting. Beloved, the supper of the Lord 
the Lord has given that to you as a constant reminder how in the past He in His great love has offered Himself so that you may have eternal life. Now you see the Lord Jesus speaks about this covenant as the new covenant in, in my blood. The Lord Jesus reminds us that through His sacrifice on the cross, He gives to us something much better much better than anything that the people of Israel ever had in the Old Testament. Remember, God made a covenant with, with Israel long ago, and in that covenant, and even though that covenant was indeed, it was a real blessing for the people. It was a joy for Israel to know that the Lord was their God, yet it was a covenant that was based on the blood of animals. And so Hebrews, in chapter 9, verse 11, the following which we read together earlier, the writer reminds us. He says, you know, the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross, that blood of Christ was far superior uh, to the blood of animals that was shed in the Old Testament. Oh, yes, in the Old Testament, uh, there the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement who would enter into the most holy place uh, there in the temple uh, where the Lord God dwells on the mercy seat of the ark. Happened once a year, and how did he enter it? He entered it with the blood of goats and calves in order to cover the sins of the people. Otherwise, he couldn't enter into it. But now he says, but no, we have the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus entered into the most holy place. That was not a copy uh, of things here on this earth like in the temple. No, he's entered into uh, the real holy place there in heaven. And he did that once for all by his own blood, having obtained for us eternal redemption. Jesus is able to enter into heaven where the Lord God dwells because he has opened the way through the shedding, uh, with the shedding of his very own blood. His life on the cross, that beloved was the great sacrifice that alone is able to pay for all of our sins. It alone can give to us eternal life with God. And that's why uh, the writer to the Hebrews continues on in chapter 9, verse 13, saying, you know that the blood of goats and bulls in the Old Testament, remember that blood can only make the people outwardly clean. In other words, it was just a, a, a symbol of what God would do, but it was just outwardly clean so that they could have a relationship with God. But when the Lord Jesus came and he shed his own blood, what does he do? He cleanses us inwardly. For his blood is a much greater blood than, than the blood of animals. It is able to cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death. And so he concludes in verse 15 that, that Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. For Christ, he says, has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins that were committed under the first covenant. What's he mean by that? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, he says, God, in his covenant, gave the people the law. And you know that the law in the Old Testament condemned everyone because it reveals to everyone how they have sinned and transgressed the law of God. And the blood of animals that was shed in the Old Testament was not able to pay uh, for the sins that the people committed when they transgressed those covenant laws of God. But Christ's blood, he says, is far superior so that through his one sacrifice on the cross, he has ransomed us. That is, he's paid for all of my sins and he gives to me the hope of eternal life. And therefore, the bread and the wine at the Lord's Supper table, you can say that they are signs, they are seals from the Lord our God by which the Lord reminds us. But also by which he wants to really assure us that he has really given his body, his blood on the cross to pay for all of my sins. That bread and that blood is a constant reminder from the Lord Jesus, where the Lord Jesus says, I really did give my life as a sacrifice on the cross for your sins. And so when the Lord Jesus indeed, when he gives you the bread and he gives you the wine, love it, then he also wants to assure us, he said, here, here is my body, here is my blood given to you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And so here, take it. Take it. 
eat it and believe that I have obtained for you the internal inheritance there in the kingdom of God. Well, beloved, the Lord's Supper is not just a memorial in which we think back to what the Lord Jesus Christ did long ago on the cross. But it also has great significance for us today in our present life. You see, the Lord Jesus didn't just make a covenant with his disciples uh, there in the last uh, meal, but he continues to enter into a covenant relationship uh, with all of his people. He does that from generation to generation. And so the Lord's Supper is a covenant meal by which the Lord assures us that, that we all have a living relationship with him. And so when we are in indeed, when we're celebrating the Lord's Supper, you can say the Lord Jesus is the host at this meal. And as the host, what does Christ do? That Christ gives to us that bread, and he gives to us the wine. And as he said to his disciples when, when he gave them the bread, so he also says to us when we receive the bread, this is my body that is given for you. And beloved, when as the host, he gives you the cup and he gives you the wine at the supper, and then he says, this is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And so today, the Lord also addresses us at the Lord's Supper. He's speaking directly to us as we sit at the table, as we, as we take hold of the bread, as we take hold of the wine. And then the Lord himself addresses us and he says, this is my body and this is the new covenant in my blood. That means that we do not just remember what happened long ago in the past. But beloved, the Lord Jesus at the supper, he's really present and he's really given to himself to us. What he's really doing at the supper table is he's offering to you his body. He's offering to you his blood for the forgiveness of your sins, for the life everlasting. Now the question that arises here is this, is so in what way, in what way does he give to us his body? How does he give to us his blood? Or better, how is the Lord really present today here at the Lord's supper table? You know, that was really the the great controversy with the Roman Church in the time of the Reformation. And it's still, it's still the issue that we have with the Roman Church today about their teaching concerning the Mass. Because as you may remember that the Roman Church teaches that the real body, the blood of the Lord Jesus, or that the, that the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus really is present at the Lord's Supper. So that they say, you know, the bread changed to the body of Christ, and the wine changed into the real blood of Christ. And therefore, what you have in the Lord's Supper, and according to the Roman Church, is, which they call the Mass, is simply that this ongoing, this continual sacrifice of the body and the blood of the Lord in Jesus. And the way, they say, in which we receive that body, and the way in which you receive the blood of the Lord Jesus is by eating his body and by drinking his blood. Well, back 500 years ago in the time of the Reformation, the Reformers, as they went back and understood the truths of God's Word, insisted that the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, the Lord Jesus really is present there at the Lord's Supper. They didn't have that. That was not the issue they had with the Roman Catholic Church. And to, to drive that point home, that the Lord Jesus is really present at the Lord's Supper, uh, the Reformers stated this very strongly in question and answer 76. Perhaps you've read over it many times. You've never really noticed it, but you notice how 70, question 76 states things very strongly when it says this. What does it mean? What does it mean to eat, to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his shed blood? I think what we do in our minds, we just kind of right away, we, we don't take it literally, we just kind of take it figuratively. But that's not the way it's worded. It's worded as if we are eating, as if we're drinking the real body and the real blood of the Lord. And then we ask, well, why such strong language in the time of the Reformation when, when they were rejecting the Roman Catholic idea that the bread and the wine changed into the real body and the real blood of the Lord Jesus well, they did that because they wanted, first of all, to express th their agreement that the Lord Jesus really is present. 
Secondly, they also wanted to reflect the words of the Lord Jesus to his disciples in John chapter 6, verse 51. Remember there, the Lord Jesus says to the people, he says that he is the living bread that has come down from heaven. And then he says something very strange. He says, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh. It is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Strong language. Jesus is saying here that, the bread, that his flesh is the bread and that he is the one that then also then through that, uh, through that flesh and through that bread he will give life. And then John writes this, and he says, well, the Jews began to argue among themselves how this man could give us his flesh to eat. So how can he give us his flesh? How can he give us his body so that we might eat it with our mouth? And so here you see how the Lord Jesus himself uses some very strong language in which he says that you must eat my flesh to be saved. If you don't eat my flesh and, and my body, then you cannot be saved. And then later on, when he celebrates the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and he gives them the bread, and he says, now eat. And he says, and this is my body. And so the Lord Jesus makes a very strong point that in order to be saved, he says, you need to be intimately connected with my body. Because if you're not connected to my body, if you do not eat of my body, you cannot be saved. Now you may also remember, now the disciples of the Lord Jesus at that particular time in John 6 began to question the Lord Jesus and they said, Lord, this is a hard teaching. It's a hard teaching that we have to eat your flesh. Who can accept it? And remember how the Lord Jesus replied in John 6, 63, he said, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. So in the end, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, and, and I think he's, he's speaking here in a way because he wants the people who are hardening their hearts uh, to harden their hearts even more. But at the same time, he also wants them to really think through what he's saying to them. But the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I'm not speaking here about a literal, physical eating of my body, but I'm speaking here about a spiritual eating. He says our, our connection with his body is not through eating the real body of Christ. But our connection to the body of Christ is a connection through faith. That's why uh, answer 76 answers in the catechism uh, that to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his blood, his shed blood. How do we do that? By accepting with a believing heart all the suffering and death of Christ and so to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. You see, here in the supper, the Lord wants to guarantee to us that through faith we are indeed we are united with his sacred body. And therefore, the bread and wine itself is not what unites us with Christ. But the bread and the wine, they are signs and they're seals of the spiritual reality of what Christ is doing for us through faith. The Lord's Supper, beloved, has no value if you do not use the supper in faith. You know, simply eating the bread doesn't mean that you now partake in the body of Christ. No, you need to eat that bread in faith. And so there in the supper, uh, the Lord reveals to us His grace. Yeah, you see His grace when, when He offers you His body there in the bread as, as a payment for all of your sins. He says, here's my gift, here's my bread for you, free of charge. And then we eat it, and we drink the wine. We drink it in faith. Why, what does that mean in faith? That means that I accept that, that, that grace. I accept that gift that He offers to me. I freely accept it with great joy, and I believe that He will do what He says He will do. As one writer put it, he says, it is as if Christ comes set to us at the supper table and he pulls us close to himself. He's like a lover who is embracing the beloved. You're at the supper. 
Christ himself comes and he embraces us by, by offering us a, a meal. And he calls us to come to him in faith and to receive from him the bread and, 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 the, and the drink to eternal life. And when you take that bread and you take that wine in faith, then we do not need to doubt the love of our Lord. No, then it is our greatest delight and our greatest joy that I might be able to share this meal of fellowship there with my Lord, and I know uh, that I am one with him through faith. And then through this meal, the Lord also assures us that through the Holy Spirit, we are being united more and more uh, to his sacred body. You know, the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who, who lives in the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved, is also the one who now comes and who lives in us when we live by faith. And it is through the Holy Spirit who is living in our hearts that we are now united with our Lord Jesus and with his body there in heaven. See what question and answer 76 says. It says that although Christ is in heaven, we're there in heaven, and we are here on this earth, Yet, he says, we are flesh of his flesh, and we are bone of his bones. In other words, since the same Spirit lives in both of us, it is as if we are one, one body with our Lord and with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And beloved, that's the whole point of the gospel. Right? The whole point of the gospel, the message of the gospel is that by faith, I am now united, and I now become one with my Lord, with my Savior, Jesus Christ. And if I am united with Christ, then everything that belongs to the Lord Jesus is also belongs to me because I'm one with him. My identity is in Christ. And that's why question and answer in 79 at the end says, second, that all his suffering, all Christ's suffering, all his obedience are as certainly ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. See, when you look through the Gospels, you read through the Bible, the great theme that you will find throughout the whole Bible is one in which we're constantly reminded that I have been buried with Christ in his death through faith, that I've been raised with him in his resurrection to a new life through faith, that I have been united with him, and that I become one with the Lord Jesus. Beloved, those are all expressions that speak about the fact that we have become one with the Lord Jesus Christ and that we now receive everything that belongs to Christ as if it is my own. So that even though I confess I am a sinner, not worthy of anything from my God, yet the Lord God in heaven looks upon me as if everything Christ has done I have personally done myself. So that all Christ's suffering, all his obedience, which he was perfect, becomes ours, as if we ourselves had suffered that, as if we ourselves had kept all the laws of God, as if we ourselves had paid for all of our sins. And therefore, when, when we sit at the supper of the Lord, beloved, here at the supper, our Father in heaven receives us as his, as his children, and he looks upon us, even though I'm a sinner, he looks upon us as if we are perfect, as if we are without any sin. And that's not because of anything that we have done, but because of what Christ has done. He reminds us that when he gives us the bread and he gives us the wine as symbols, he says, this is my guarantee that I have given my life for you on the cross. And this is my guarantee that you now have the forgiveness of your sins, that you have the life everlasting. Don't doubt it. I've done it, and I did it for you. And then, beloved, that gives us then also the confidence for the future. During that celebration of the last Passover, in that upper room, the Lord Jesus at one point took the cup with wine in it, and he told his disciples to, uh, to divide it among themselves, and then he said this, he says, and I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. You see, the Lord Jesus knew that the fellowship uh, that the disciples were enjoying with him at, at this moment, at this time, was quickly going to come to an end. 
the very night he's going to be betrayed. The next day he would be uh, placed on a trial. So he's going to be taken away from them. He'll be arrested. He will be tried and then he will be crucified on the cross and he'll die. Yes, and then he'll be raised up in the resurrection, but then the Lord will only remain with his disciples for some 40 days before he, uh, he leaves them and again and he ascends up into heaven. So that's the reality in which we're living today. We are separated from our Lord Jesus in the sense that he is now in heaven and we are here on this earth. And at the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus talks about that reality that he knows is going to be there in the future. Of course, the Lord Jesus doesn't mean that, uh, that he will no longer be with us. After all, we've already said here in the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus assures us that we are fully united with him by faith and through his Holy Spirit. But beloved, that's just a, a very a shadow of what we desire, what we're looking for. The fellowship that we have with the Lord today is not the kind of fellowship that we are longing for. And so the Lord's Supper is a constant reminder that we are still longing for something better and more glorious. Oh, we rejoice. Yes, we can rejoice already today at the assurance that we are united with our Lord Jesus by faith. But beloved, that only creates in us an even stronger longing for the day when we'll be able to see Him face to face. That's why the bread and the wine at the Lord's Supper it's a constant reminder of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get away from thinking about him when you celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're reminded about his body, his blood. They're in the bread and the wine, and, and so it creates in us, it should create in us, and a constant desire that we might be united with our Lord, also in a bodily way. Right, that bread and wine constantly directs our attention to the Lord Jesus in heaven. I know, yes, he is ruling there at the right hand of God, but I'm eagerly looking forward to the day when he will again return with his body and when we will be united with him for eternity in the kingdom of our God. The Apostle John sees a glimpse of that future joy in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 19, verse 18 and 19. There he's being transported to a vision, in, a, in a vision to the day of judgment. When Babylon will be completely destroyed and the day of judgment comes. But then on that day of judgment he also hears a certain shouting. Great mighty sound of shouting where he hears this. Hallelujah! For our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. And there we have it. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Beloved, in the Lord's Supper, oh, we don't only look back to the past. We don't only praise the Lord God for his great work of salvation that he did for us long ago on the cross. No, we are also reminded that today our Lord has given himself to us as a great sacrifice for all of my sins. Yes, I may already be assured that my sins are forgiven. I have life evermore with my God. What a joy that I may know already today that I'm united with my Lord, that I have salvation. But that also causes us, beloved, to look forward, look forward to the future when our Lord will again return in the flesh as the great Lamb. In the Lord's Supper, we already receive a taste of the joy that will come. When the great bridegroom, Jesus Christ, who is the great Lamb, will come. And when we will sit then at the marriage feast of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah says in Isaiah 11 verse 9 that on that day, referring to that day when God will restore everything to perfection. It's on that day. The earth will be full of all the, the, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Well, the waters cover the whole sea. There's nothing that's not covered. And so on that day, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the whole earth so that it will be everywhere in perfection. On that day, the Lord will be present with us forever. And our knowledge of Christ will be perfect. And our joy, our joy, beloved, will be complete. And so when Christ now gives to you the bread, 
when he gives to you the wine at his supper. What's he doing? He's giving you a constant reminder. And he's giving you this absolute guarantee, and he's giving you that wonderful assurance that you will live with him forever, one day there in the glorious kingdom of God. His covenant promise to you is that he will give you the forgiveness of sins. He will give you the life everlasting. He says, this, of this you may be absolutely sure. And therefore, in faith, you may eagerly look, look forward. You may eagerly await the day of the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.